Rockets Podcast. You're listening to the Premier Rockets Podcast. It's H Town Hoops, hosted by Brandon Scott and Adam Spolane. Whenever I talk to somebody who listens to this podcast or more generally just knows what I do for a living and they're a basketball fan or a Rockets fan specifically, I get the question, hey, are the Rockets going to make the playoffs this year? Are the Rockets going to make the jump? How big of a jump do you think that they're going to make? I think that they have, at the very least, everyone's attention, or at least the people who care, they have their attention after making the best turnaround or having the best turnaround in the NBA last year, a 19-game turnaround. And so Brandon Scott here with Adam Spillane, the H-Town Who's podcast, is back from his offseason hiatus to define success and talk about expectations. Adam, how you living, man? I'm good. Been a while. It's good to talk to you. And good yeah, to see man. you. Yeah, man. I, I feel the same way, man. We've had a lot going on. And, of course, we've seen each other in – in other capacities and other places, but there hasn't been a lot of room or a lot of space to really talk about the Rockets. But I do want to pick it up right there with how we're defining success this year. Here's where I'm at. I think that they can achieve their goal. They were really close to it last year, obviously. But I think that the Rockets can actually achieve their goals without making this tremendous jump or leap in say win total or their actual record like i think they can win a couple of more games 43 44 games somewhere around there and find themselves in the mix for a play-in spot so so i don't i don't think that the that the improvement has to necessarily be that drastic for them to have a successful season but if we're talking about how to define success, I'm interested to get your thought on this, Adam. I think it is unquestionably making it into the playoffs. Like, I don't think you can be close or improve without making the postseason. Like, if they win more games but somehow don't get into the play-in or don't get into the playoffs, that to me would not be the definition of success. Defining success to me is actually being in the playoffs this year. What say you? Yeah, it's a it's a hard question just because like if they were in the Eastern Conference, you would say it has to be they got to get into the top six, you know, at least the top eight win one of those play in games and at least, you know, play play in a playoff series and compete in a playoff series. I, I think in the West, it's so difficult because every team is trying, you know, there are two teams that aren't trying and then San Antonio's in kind of a, we'll see type mode, but they made moves to make you think that they want to try to win games this year. But then, I mean, that still makes 12 teams. If you don't count San Antonio, 12 teams that are going to be trying to win games uh, this season. And like, they have to be better than two of them just to get into the play-in. And it's no, uh, you know, to me, I think that they can be better than at least two of them, but I don't think it's any, I don't think it's a lock by any stretch just because of how good some of those other teams are. Like they, they finished 11th last year. Memphis finished behind them. Memphis is going to be better this year. I mean, Memphis has an opportunity to, Memphis should be in the playoffs. I mean, that's a 50 win team that is getting all of its guys back. So that's a team that should be in the playoffs. And then like, of the other teams of the, of the 10 teams that finished ahead of the Rockets last year, would you, I mean, there are a couple teams that I would say are candidates that would, that, that you would pick to drop below them this season. You know, the Clippers certainly would be one, maybe golden state. If that team uh, ages, you know, poorly, but I think they had an okay off season. Um, the Lakers still have LeBron James and Anthony Davis who proved, you know, on the Olympic team that they're two of the best players in the world still at this stage. So it's tough. I, I think, I don't know if I define it necessarily in a team sense as more of like an individual sense. Like if you see improvement from Jalen Green, if you see consistency from Jalen Green, then they should be better. If you see uh, consistency and improvement from Alperin Shingun, they should be better. If a men Thompson figures out how to shoot, they should be better. And so then I, I think that with the individual success will come the team success. Yeah, so I'm I'm glad you ended it with that because to me that's what it really is about. Like, and I think that's where some of the outside expectation comes from. Like, you are projecting that Alperin Shingun, Jalen Green. We'll talk about these guys a little bit later on, but like Alperin Shingun, Jalen Green, 
Amen Thompson. Of course, you add Reed Shepard, the rookie. So you've added a shooting dynamic. We'll see how much he plays, but you've added a shooting dynamic to your team that everything, all, like all signs point toward some sort of progression. So I, I understand where you're coming from in, in terms of, hey, like if you just can get the individual improvement, the guys that are supposed to be developing, if they are developing, that you could consider that a success or define a season as a success in that way. But to me, I just feel like they've sort of run out of time of selling. And even if it's the reality, it feels like they've run out of time of selling hope or selling the future or selling development as success. You know, like at, at this point, it, it, it feels like, especially after you've kind of set the table or, or set an expectation after last year, what was possible in terms of improvement now it's like the the only next step as a team and, and i think that's what people care about ultimately the only next step as a team is for all of this to come together and at the very least result in you in the play-in with an opportunity to be in the playoffs and your point about being in the west versus the east is a good one but i don't know how much they can rely on that because you're in the west you've been in the west it's not like it's not like being in the West or the circumstances of the West have caught you off guard. You're building your team in the West and always have been. So like, so that, that I feel like should have always been in mind. And, and I like, I don't, I just don't know how much you're going to be able to, to actually rely on that. So, so, so to me, the, the success has to still be like it, not to oversimplify it, but it does have that playoff robust feel for it. Cause otherwise what exactly are we here doing? Yeah. But I think that's like the tough, like, I think they're probably ahead of schedule last year. Like I don't think anybody thought that they were going to go 41 and 41 and be the last team to miss out on the play in the Western conference. And so like, let's, let's say, let's put it in, in this respect. Let's say Memphis doesn't have the season from hell. Let's say that, you know, Morant does, you know, he serves his suspension. That team stays above water for those, for the, for that, for that 25 game stretch. Morant comes back, plays the entire season, all those plays the rest of the season. All those other guys stay healthy and Memphis wins 47 games and makes the playoffs. And let's say the Rockets finish 12th in the West instead of 11th in the West. And they go, let's, let's say 38 and 44. Like, I think that the expectations that we're talking about for this season would be different had they gone 38 and 44 last year, which is not, you know, that I don't think that's out of the question. I mean, they, they beat up on Memphis, you know, in those games and all those games were without Morant. So let's say Morant plays. And then all of a sudden you take three wins off the, off the ledger and they're six games under 500 instead of right at 500. Then I think that the expectations for this season would be very, very different. So I think oftentimes when you see a team make a big wins jump, the way that the Rockets did last year, Oftentimes they might take a little bit of a step back just because it's hard to take two big steps in a row because I think some sometimes there's just kind of the feeling that uh, maybe we weren't quite as good. Now that being said, it's not like everything went right for them last year. You know, it's not like everything that could have gone right for them went right. They had a bunch, you know, they had some injury luck early on in the year, but once you got past Christmas, they really were never healthy at any point the rest of that season, whether it was Dylan Brooks who got hurt, Tari Eason who got hurt, Alperin Chengun who got hurt. They gave away some games I can think of, and I'm going to bring this up once we get into training camp, but they had three games where they were up three in the final seconds and they tried to give fouls and they could not execute that, and they lost two of those games. So, like, if they just win those games, then all of a sudden you're looking at a 43 and 39 type team. So, I, I think it's, I think for me, it's going to like if they go 42 and 40 in the West and miss the play in, I don't know if I would consider that a disappointing season based on what the teams in front of them do. Like, it, now if they, if they, if they win 37 games and are nowhere near the play, and then to me, that's disappointing. But I just think that you want to see improvement, and maybe improvement means that they don't make the play in because of how good the other teams are in the conference. Yeah, and and far be it for me to to split the hairs of defining success versus that's not disappointing. You know, like disappointment mm -hmm. versus this is a success. Like we, you and I think you and I understand there could be some gray area there. Like I think last year was a success because of the turnaround. 
an but overwhelming think, success. An overwhelming last, success. Last year was an overwhelming success. Yeah. When you consider the injuries that they dealt with and the fact that they they went from 22 wins to 41 wins and were still in the, the play-in mix in April. That is an overwhelming success. Yeah, but, but I do think that there is a, a potential for middle ground or gray area of, hey, maybe this isn't a grave disappointment, maybe like a, a scenario like you painted out, but it wasn't necessarily successful if we're sitting at home at the end of the year the same way that we have been all of these other years. But I'm glad that you mentioned Memphis cause just because as an aside, I think you've mentioned them a couple of times now. I do feel like they are one of the teams, one of the obvious teams, if you just look at the standings and look at who didn't make it and who has the potential to be there in the mix. They are the obvious candidate that is standing in the Rockets' way of reaching said success because of everything that you just talked about, how they weren't healthy and just it was the season from hell for Memphis last year and expected it not to be that way for them this year. John Morant's going to be there in the mix. And then, of course, the other one. So we point out Memphis. And then the other one, reluctantly, man, but we got to be real about it, is San Antonio. And I don't know what to how to feel about San Antonio just yet, but I do feel like Victor Wimbanyama showed us enough for us to feel like every year, as long as he's healthy, as long as he's available and out there playing basketball, that every year that they continue to build around him, given the the, the way that that organization is operated and the talent that he's got, that they're going to be an issue. So between the Spurs and, of course, the Grizzlies, those feel like the two biggest candidates of standing in the way of the Rockets achieving this arbitrary success that I've tried to define. I mean, Memphis finished top three in the West the last two years, you know, before this past season. So, I mean – to me, that, that Memphis is closer to to fighting it out for home court in the first round than they are the play in, assuming all those guys stay healthy. So I put Memphis right now in a t- in maybe even two tiers above where the Rockets are at this point. To me, the Rockets are back in that tier with like New Orleans and the, the Clippers and the Lakers probably, and Golden State and Sacramento and San Antonio and San Antonio in that group. So that's the group that you're really focused on. Just to me, I, I think that Memphis is just in a different class if all those guys stay healthy. And to me, that's obviously a big if. But again, that's what's so tough about the Western Conference. And that's why, you know, putting the success on having the success of your season ride on whether or not you get into the play in or the playoffs is tough just because there are 15 teams in the West, at least 12 of them are trying to win and you know, are they may very well be better than you. And then there's that other team in San Antonio that might be trying to win. We'll have to kind of wait and see, but their ceiling is so high because of how good their best player could actually be. So that's, that's why, that's why they're in such a tough spot. And that's why to me, it's more going to be about there. There are two things that I've, that I think are going to be important for them. Individual success of certain guys, and then can they really start to figure out what their team is moving forward? Because they got a lot of guys, and Tillman Fertitta mentioned this yesterday, they're the deepest team in the NBA. I don't know if I would go that far, but they are very deep, and they're going to need to pare this down a little bit because they can't you – know, they're, they're bringing back – think about this. They are bringing back their top 12 guys in minutes played last year. Top 12. And then they're adding Reed Shepard and Steven Adams to that mix. Like, that's absurd. I don't think I, it is very possible that's never happened before. Yeah. So just to be clear on the point about Memphis, I I, I just mentioned them as as part of the numbers game. Like like I agree with you in terms of what their ceiling is versus some of those other teams that you mentioned. I just mean in terms of the teams that didn't make it and that can make it this year, they're the obvious one, and I agree with you of of, of where they are. But on this thing about what Tillman said about them being the deepest, first of all, I don't agree, but also. Can we just establish right now that depth is good, but like depth in and of itself is good, but depth does also does not necessarily mean good. You know, like just because you're deep does not mean you're good, even though it is good to be deep. Does that make sense? Well, depth is great until you have to use it, basically. Right, right. That's what I'm saying. It's like, don't tell me about how deep you are. Tell me about how good you are, right? But I I think that that's – it's so tough because of they've drafted so many guys and, you know, they brought in the, the veteran free agents uh, last summer 
And, you know, so they, they got a lot of guys. And I think there are a lot of guys who you look at their top 12. I think most of that top 12 would be in the rotation of most teams in the league at this point. Like, you know, maybe, you know, maybe Jeff Green is in, in a rotation on an, on an NBA team's rotation at this point. But, you know, for the most part, that group, they would play for just about anyone. They might not start for everybody, but they play for everyone. And that's what I, I think is going to be that, – that's why I think they really need to figure out who are their, like, top eight guys moving forward. I think yeah. that should be the goal of this season is to figure out who that top eight is going to be. Yeah, I, I, I would say aside from just the turnaround itself, the the biggest success story so far about the team, like just as we stand here right now, is that they've got a team full of credible NBA players. You know, and that's not something that you could have said about the Rockets throughout the entire time of this rebuild since the last time that they were actually good. So, you know, the last four years or whatever it's been, you could not say that about their team, that they've got a team full of actual real life, credible players. I want to get to this and you, it's, it's the perfect transition because you kind of touched on it a little bit when you mentioned, you know, bringing back their top 12 players and the individual success being a, a part of the way to define success. And then also finding their, identity maybe like nailed down one or let's just key in it on a little bit more because i i'm interested in what you think is the main key to progress like the main key to progress for the rockets and we can get away from the minutia of exactly how you define success or progress just make it how you define it the main key to that like i i've got a very simple one because of some of the things that you've already mentioned, like they're bringing back basically the same team, just adding a rookie, a rookie and, and, and a vet and, and, and Steven Adams, a rookie and Reed Shepard and a vet and Steven Adams. But to me, the main key to progress would be health. Like I, I feel like I can make a real credible argument to you, Adam, that if Alperin Shingoon doesn't miss 19 or 20 games or whatever it was at the end and and you don't lose Tari Eason for that long stretch, that this is a better basketball team a deeper basketball team and perhaps one that does make the plan. I mean, we'll never know, but you could make that argument. I think one of the main keys would be for that injury luck that they had early in the season to be kind of scattered out, scattered throughout and balanced out a little bit better to where they're actually a healthy team. Cause I think there's going to be some natural progression if they can just stay healthy. And they, and I can't remember exactly because I wrote this at, at one point, they used two starting lineups the first 27 games of the year, something like that. Like they, their main starting lineup was able to start 26 of the first 27 games. And then Dylan Brooks got hurt and Eason got, and Eason was, you know, Eason wasn't starting, but then Brooks got hurt. Van Vliet missed a little bit of time right before the all-star break. And then there was the Shingo thing. So they were just like shuffling guys in and out of the lineup, especially by the end of the year. Now, listen, it, it, injuries happen in this league. Like nobody is keeping their team together the entire season, especially just with the way the league is now. So the idea that they're going to be able to avoid, like they might've had good injury luck last year when you compare it to what might happen this year. That's just how the league is. Uh, and then you also, you consider that they had one of their starters and probably one of their best players in Jalen green play all 82 games. Um, the year before they had a couple guys play all 82 games. So it, it's, it, I, I don't know if, Injury luck is something that they can, you know, you can hope for. But I do think that they're better equipped to deal with injuries right now. Um, I think that they, you saw how bad it got because they lost Eason and Brooks at the same time. And they really struggled defensively after that. I think they are better equipped to deal with that. They were a little too small when they lost Shengun. I think they are better equipped to deal with that if Shengun were to miss some time. Uh, they really did not have a point guard during the stretches where Fred Van Vliet was hurt. I think that they are much better equipped to deal with that at this point. So the big thing is, and why I think that they're better and why the depth matters is that if they do have guys go down this season, they are far better equipped to deal with it now than they were last year. And then even you look the year before when they lost Kevin Porter. I mean, they, this is a team that lost Kevin Porter Jr. and completely flatlined for a 20 game stretch. Like, can you imagine saying that now <laughs> they, that Kevin Porter jr. Was so important to their team two years ago that they went three and 17 and could not create offense when he was not out there. What if I told you, what, let me throw this out there. It, it is wild. The, the cold Kevin Porter jr. 
era now when you look at where they're at now it's like man i can't believe that actually happened i i think i was actually talking about this with someone just the other day the rock is and this is maybe the most uncovered not talked about wild thing that's happened in houston sports because of how irrelevant the team was at the time but it actually happened that the rocket sent home two of their key players during the game like at what was it halftime when kevin porter jr and christian wood got sent home a couple uh, years wood ago. didn't get sent home wood wood, was, wood stayed he just didn't want to go back in the game okay kevin porter jr went home and they said that he had a leg injury yeah but, that, they sent out the message saying kevin porter jr will not return due to a leg injury and then they lied about it post game yeah so but all of that actually happened like mm -hmm. basically sent a dude home and, and probably wanted to send the other dude home and nobody talked about it because of how irrelevant the team was how aimless the team was it just did not i mean who cares about dysfunction when you're not headed anywhere to to begin with but we didn't i don't i, mean, I don't even feel like we fixated on just the soap opera nature of that but to go from that to this, I think is, you know, I, I think is why a lot of people are excited because they feel like it's, you know, it's far less shenanigans and far less of a, you know, a waste of their time and something that's that's worthwhile. What what if I threw out to you this as a as a key to progress? Because I think this is going to be big as well. I know I mentioned health. What about Amin Thompson and what he like? How they use him? What his growth is from year one to year two i've got no idea what that's gonna look like but i do feel like based off of what we watched last year and what we know about him in thompson is that that is something for rockets fans to at least feel good about you know the the the, the skill set translating the way that it did and I, like I, I think that amen i don't know how much he's gonna play i don't know and we'll talk about minutes and things like that in a second but i like i i feel like he is an interesting wild card for the Rockets as well. Well, he's a guy that was picked in the top four and he's incredibly talented and already very good at most things on an NBA court, but just, he has the one fatal flaw. And if he can fix that one fatal flaw, it completely changes what he can be as a player and it completely changes how they can use him. Like if he, if he shows some development with the shot, then that helps with floor spacing. It helps where you can play him. They liked using him in the dunker spot last year when he didn't have the ball. Well, that clogs up spacing a little bit when you have somebody there. Um, you can certainly use him in that spot, but also it, I'm sure that they wouldn't mind if they could have him, you know, outside and, you know, freeing up some space uh, in the paint. So I, I do think that the defensively, he's going to be able to handle himself against basically anyone. Uh, he can rebound. He's a he's a great rebounder. I do think that he got taller. It, it does feel like he got taller. But did, did, wait, did he get taller or did he get taller like Shingun did last? You remember last year Shingun was supposed to be seven two all of a sudden, and then he was still six <laughs> nine. Well, I, I think that he actually I, I, did get I, some of the, some of his teammates actually believe that he got taller. Okay, and he's so he's so young and so like yeah, who knows? You know, it, it's one of those things that. I don't know if they're going to like do measurements and all that sort of stuff again. I doubt they will, but you'll have to see it. You know, they're, they're on the court here. They'll, they'll play a preseason game here in the next, what, 10 days or so. It's an interesting nugget too, though, Adam, because it's not like for, for what he does and what his skill set is, it's not like anybody's been walking around like, man, you know what the men Thompson needs? Just a couple of more inches on yeah. that height, man. If he, if he was six, eight or six, nine, man, it would be over with like, he's, plenty tall already and, and athletic enough so like that's a that's an interesting observation that they would make it about him yeah and in fairness everybody seems tall to me so i don't know but they uh they, but to me the big thing is just the shot like can it be passable i'm not telling you that he needs to be a good jump shooter but can he be a passable jump shooter to where you have to make teams at least respect that part of your game somewhat because last year teams I mean, there's no reason to respect that part of his game. So to me, I think that that's going to be the first step for him. And basically you go to Detroit and you'd say the same thing about his brother. You know, like if his brother ever learned how to shoot, then that completely changes the type of player that he would be. So I would hope both those guys spent a lot of time together in the gym and just shot the ball. And that's what they spent most of their time doing this summer. Because if you can, we know that he can play on the ball. You know, we know that he can do that. Can he be off the ball and be a threat 
on the perimeter. Like to me, I think that just changes that changes the whole trajectory of him. And I do think that it just it frees up and allows them to do so much more offensively if that happens. Oh, I'd go even a step further. Like that's if he's passable, like you said. And I think passable is actually a fair and reasonable expectation. Like, hey, you know, you're a pro. You got a great attitude. You're a great athlete. Let's progress. Let's develop into a passable shooter. And I think eventually, if it's not this year, eventually he'll do that. But you, you made that little distinction between good and passable. Like if it gets good, I like I, I think that is the difference between him opening things up the way you just described and actually being the best player on the team. Like if he's a good shooter, then all of a sudden it, it doesn't just change what you can do around him or, or with him. It to me it changes exactly like how you build your team. Like to me, you're talking about a kind of a more of a franchise player if he's actually able to shoot now it's a it's a lot to ask to go from not being able to shoot at all to being a good shooter so i'm not saying that that's gonna happen but to me he is a credible jump shot away from actually killing any of the debates that we're about to have about who's the top player on the team and i know we're gonna try to figure out you know they want to try to figure out who their top eight is you mentioned that as one of their goals if not their top goal this year but if he had that, I feel like that there will be a, a much clearer answer to who your best player would be because he basically has not too many other weaknesses in his game at all, if any. No, I think I think that's probably the biggest one, and that's the Achilles heel right now. Um, defensively, he's great. He's a great rebounder. He's an incredible athlete. Um, he can make shots in traffic. Like that's the one part of his game that's missing, and it's just it's just really bad. It just was really bad. I don't know what it is now. It was really bad. And um, that's probably one of the biggest things that that you need to. That's the one skill that is probably most important in today's NBA is just that tool is the shooting tool. So if he if he fixes that, if he becomes, you know, I, like he said, he he was horrific last year. You're not going to go from horrific to good in the span of you know six months like that. You know, there's some steps that come with that. But if he can just get to passable right now, it changes a lot of things. So these things did not happen at the same time last year, but they did happen. Alperen Shingun emerging as just really a frontline player, like the best player on a good team, a winning team. I know the Rockets weren't necessarily a winning team at that point, but it looked like he could be the best player on a winning team up until his injury. And then after his injury, Jalen Green had that stretch there where he played absolutely out of his mind and looked like an all NBA type of player. So both of those things happen somewhat, I would say, separately, even though I think that was probably more coincidence than people want to give it credit for. But it did. It did happen separately. What do you think? What's your level of anticipation of watching? the Shingoon green fit. This is something that we've talked about before. And I don't think either of us buy into the notion that these guys can't play together or that they're not a good fit, which you probably going to see in some pockets on the internet. We don't believe that. But when you talk about their fit, after you talk about their progression from last year, it is something to watch and something that I think is intriguing uh, for two players that came in the league at the same time, both up for extensions and seem to be making and taking leaps in their game. Yeah. I, I do want to dispel the notion that they played their best basketball when Shingun was hurt because that, that wasn't the case. They played their best basketball in the fall um, when Shingun was playing at a really high level. I, I do think that they went on the winning streak. You know, the, the winning streak started before Shingun got hurt and obviously it continued after he got hurt, but they, they had a very friendly schedule, let's say, during that yeah. stretch. I, I think that the stretch in, I guess it was probably November, December, that was probably the best that they played, and a lot of that was Shingun. Um, I don't think, I, I think there's no question that those two can fit together. Um, I, I just, you've seen it where they can be a really good pick-and-roll pairing. Uh, they had a lot of success with that over the last two years uh, with Jalen Green as a ball handler and Shingun as a screen. I, I think that that can certainly work. Um, it's just, I, I think the big thing for green is that he got a little bit passive when Shingun was on the floor. And I think that as a team, they play, they played a little slow last year. 
And I don't think that that necessarily fits what Jalen Green is best at. If you, if Jalen Green is going to be on the floor, you need to play fast. Like you need to play at a very fast pace. And that was what was so different about them after the all-star break last year was that they went from one of the slowest paced teams to one of the fastest paced teams. And that's when Jalen Green excels when the game is played at a very fast pace. I don't think there is any doubt that they can play fast with Shingun on the floor. And I think that's the thing that they really need to focus on is, hey, if we get a defensive stop and we get the defensive rebound, push the ball up the floor and let's get some early offense. If it's not there in transition, then we can slow it down and then we can dump it to the big guy and let him go to work. Like I think that that I think that that is a good way to use both of their strengths together is to play fast when you have those opportunities. And if the game slows down a little bit, then you can give the ball to Shingun. Now, the big thing that they've got to, that, and this is on green, can he shoot? You know, it's it's about the shooting for him. Can he be a consistent three-point threat? Because when he was struggling last year, when Shingun was on the floor, he was not making shots. He was, what, 31, 32%. For a good portion of last season, up until he got hot in March, so that's going to be the big thing for him. Like I think that I, I don't think he has any trouble fitting with Alperin Shingun if he's able to make threes, because you know Shingun's going to create that shot for him. Like you know that's going to be there. Can he make that shot consistently? Can he avoid the turnovers? He got a little turnover happy last year. Can he take better care of the basketball? And can they, as a team, and a lot of this is on Van Vliet, can they play at a faster pace? when Shingun is on the floor. I think that if they can do that, there's no question that those two can play together. Yeah. It, and and I don't see, I don't see why they wouldn't be able to do it. It's also another reason why Men Thompson is fascinating because he helps with that as a rebounder and somebody who can help them push the pace. Um, and, and one of these somewhat positionless types of players, I think, I think he helps in that kind of in that mix as well. But I, I am intrigued by this, Adam, more than anything, because this now is the year, you know, like this is the year where we find out kind of going back to your earlier point about finding out who your top eight guys are. I think that's a good point. I think that is something that they're trying to figure out. They also need to figure out who their top one, two guys are like I, I think that's still in question right now. And, and I don't think it necessarily matters who it is as long as it is somebody like to to come out of it feeling like between the two of these guys at least one of them is worth being invested in as the best player on a team that we're trying to win with which again to the earlier point about Shingun, i feel like it's something that he established himself as like legitimately before he got hurt so i, I i'm i'm intrigued to see how how it works out like the you know, I'd imagine that they'd all be like highly, highly motivated to make things work. And you mentioned the shooting again with Green. I mean, my goodness, man, like it couldn't it couldn't have been any worse than it was at one point earlier on in the year. And he's another one who it feels like is just a credible and consistent jump shot away from being a completely different player. Uh, and, and with him, that's more of a thing about consistency. The reason why Jalen Green to me isn't a consistent player is not because for a lot of the silly reasons that you might hear people talk about, it's really just the inconsistency of the shot because the one thing that he did seem to get better at, you talked about being passive. He did seem to be a better decision maker and to grow like the, the impact of, of having MA Udoka and, and Fred Van Vliet and, you know, even Dylan Brooks to, I guess, to some degree, like in his orbit to me was was shown in how he made decisions on the court he just could not knock down open jump shots You're like it eventually it does not matter how smart you are how much you know about the game there can be things out there that you or i know to do but we can't make the shot or we can't run up and down the floor like we just physically can't do it so and for jalen green who has like physical capabilities out of this world the jump shot is the one where hey i'm I, I, I'm interested to see what that looks like. If that, if that is a more consistent threat throughout the season. And those two have a lot on the line. Like, let's be honest, you know, a lot of guys from that 2021 draft class have gotten paid and ultimately they will get paid by someone. 
it might be the Rockets. It might not be the Rockets. We'll have to wait and see. But, you know, those guys have something to prove. And I imagine I, I'm really looking forward to seeing them just because we haven't seen them play basketball in such a long time. You know, Jalen Green, we really, you know, you see little workout clips and, and stuff like that. That doesn't matter at all. But we haven't seen him play since, what, the middle of April? Haven't seen Shingun play since March. And, you know, in the past couple of years, you've been able to see Shingun play some international stuff. He didn't play any international basketball uh, this summer. So I'm just looking forward to see how they look, what type of shape they're in, and is there improvement? And you'll see that during the first preseason game. So um, they don't... Well, I'm sure we'll talk about this plenty over the course of the season, but they've got a lot of decisions to make when it comes to these young guys and who they want to extend, who they don't want to extend. They technically don't have to extend any of these guys. Like they don't have to extend all seven of their first round picks. They could, if they wanted to, they don't have to. It's just a matter of who, who deserves it and who do they think is a fit moving forward long-term. Uh, and I think that's what Jalen Green and Alperin Shingun are really going to have to try and prove here over the course of this season. It, it's fascinating to me, though, like it, it, so this would reach over to the side for a second, that four of what we had known before as the core six, four of the guys in the core six are guys who I just want them. And, and I probably shouldn't include Jabari Smith Jr. in this, but I'm going to include him anyway, because that even his shot has not necessarily lived up to the expectation. He's a better shooter than, other, than those other guys, I would say. But overall, from Jalen Green to Alper Shingun to Jabari Smith, like uh, all of these guys, uh, and, and of course, Amin Thompson, all of these guys, it's like, man, if we could just make you a more consistent shooter, a more consistent outside shooter, boy, could we open up some things in your game? Boy, does it change the conversation around you as a player? Which actually brings me to Reed Shepard. I know I know I said put him to the side for a second, but let's bring him back. Reed Shepard. If he if he doesn't play his way onto the court, and I think that he will. If he doesn't play his way onto the court, could he at least be like a an assistant shooting coach? Like do you think Reed Shepard's shooting acumen at the very least can rub off on the rest of these guys, the rest of the core and help like Hey, y'all go work with Reed for a little while and work on that jump shot and see if it rubs off a little bit. Because I, to me, that is one of the more fascinating things to watch is like how they, how do they use Reed Shepard? How does he not play his way onto the floor considering that he offers a thing that not many guys on that team offer? Yeah, I just, I think for him, is can he hold up defensively? I, I think ultimately that's going to be the question for him is can he hold up against bigger guys. And listen, you know he's going to be targeted all the time defensively. They are going to go after him every single time down the floor and just like, how does he handle it? And you heard um, Hime Udoko talk about how his mom would always talk about don't be soft. And so that's going to be the big thing for him. I, I do think there are, there are certainly ways for him to get minutes just because I think that he is probably right now going into camp, the backup point guard. Maybe that's the case. Maybe that's not the case, but I do think there is certainly he, I, I do think that he will have minutes set aside for, I don't know if set aside is the right way to put it. But well, hold on, hold on. Shouldn't he be though? Like, cause I, I saw you like the backup point guard question mark. I feel like he should be. And, and if for no other reason, because a men Thompson could, could be in theory, the backup anything. Yeah, exactly. You know, like that, that's what, that's the luxury of him being the player that he is that Reed Shepard, if, you know, granted, if he can do these things that you're talking yeah. about, like not be a cone out there and not be a liability on the de on the defensive end, shouldn't he be the backup point guard? I say backup point guard mostly because I think that's probably the only position that he can guard, at least right now, because yeah. of the size. Like, um, Amin Thompson can guard anyone one through four, and he could probably guard centers if you needed him to. I don't know if Reed Shepard – like – I think that's one of the things I want to look for. Can you play Reed Shepard and Fred Van Vliet together? Like, I think that's – you're asking a whole lot of those two little guys if you want to try and do that. That's why, to me, I kind of would have Shepard in there kind of as that backup point guard. And maybe he's not 
you and know what's interesting? Got- if 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 Reed Shepard turns out to be just talked about how his mom and 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 Emma Udoka talked about him not being soft, don't be soft. If Reed Shepard can has any of the dog in him that Fred Van Vliet does defensively, then it's kind of interesting. I mean, I'm not saying he does, obviously. But if that rubs off on him or if he can be anything close to that, it makes it a kind of an interesting proposition. You probably still don't want him out there at the same time, but it does answer the question of, hey, can he hold can he hold his own defensively? And, and even if he can't hold his own defensively, it's not necessarily – it might not be because he's soft. It's just that he's 20 years old, and 20-year-olds 20 year, 20 year aren't necessarily – the strongest guys in the world and they aren't the most, you know, physically uh, developed guys in the world. You know, Fred Van Vliet's 30 at this point. So he can, he knows how to hold up. He knows some of the tricks, you know, and, and Fred Van Vliet played with Kyle Lowry for a long time. You know, who, who knows the tricks better than Kyle Lowry. Uh, and, and I'm sure that that rubbed off on Van Vliet. Now that'll rub off here on Shepard a little bit. So it's a, uh, it's a very interesting um, dynamic between the two. It's interesting just to see how, those minutes get deployed and you know it was interesting last year because Aaron Holiday is not a big guy either but they did have Aaron Holiday and Van Vliet on the floor together now again two older guys who know how to probably play up physically than maybe their size would indicate I want you to be honest about this man do you really honestly believe that Fred Van Vliet was ever a child um I, I, I don't I, I like I, pictures I, I I until I do I, I am convinced until you can prove otherwise that Fred Van Vliet was born with that beard born with that mature disposition born leadership like I you said that he's 30 I feel like he's been 30 the entire time like 30 for the entire 30 years that he's been on planet earth don't, I'm I not looked, convinced. I'm not convinced he was ever a child. I I am looking at pictures of him from Wichita State, and this is like early Wichita State. He looks younger, but he doesn't look young. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna mess with him about this. I'm gonna say, hey man, I'm, and I'll I'll say this confidently because I'm 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 older than Fred Van Bleet, but I'm gonna say, hey man, however old you are, have you actually been that age the entire time? Since the very beginning, I could see it. I could see it a hundred percent. I could see it. Um, who, who's the odd man out, man? Who, who we're talking about, Reed Shepard. Obviously, we're talking about a man Thompson earlier, and the, the, Tillman Fertitta's comment earlier about them being the supposed deepest team in the NBA. There is some depth there, but there's also some conflict and some decisions to be made. We we're kind of getting at this earlier. How do you see these rotations shaking out? I don't have a great answer for this. That's why I'm intrigued to watch it play out. But, like, who who do you think is the odd man out in the rotations when it feels like you got to get a man Thompson on the floor even though Tari Easton's coming back? You've got to I, – I feel like you've got to figure out a way for Reed Shepard to play as long as he's not a liability on the defensive side because he's that good of a shooter and you don't have many of them on your team. What – Cam Whitmore is another person that showed a lot of promise when he was called upon last year, but I'm not exactly sure where his minutes come from this year if health goes the way that I'm sure the Rockets wanted to go. Who you think is the odd man out in these rotations? Yeah, it's funny. I haven't even thought about Whitmore, to be honest with you. That's how kind of just so many guys and just what the log jam is. I think if you look at – we mentioned the top 12. They're bringing back the top 12 uh, in terms of minutes played from last year. And like Van Vliet's going to play. Shengun's going to play. Jabari's going to play. Jalen's going to play. Dylan Brooks is going to play. Amin Thompson's going to play. Tar East is going to play. That's when, once you get past seven, I think that's when you can start to say, okay, this guy might not get the minutes this year that he was getting last year. I think Whitmore still plays. I, I you know, I don't necessarily know how that looks, but again, the ceiling for him, the offensive ceiling is so high. The the fact that he can shoot and he's got good size, they will find a way for him to play. But once you get past Whitmore at eight, I don't think they want to play Jeff green nearly as much this year as they did last year. Like they leaned on Jeff green and Jeff green is 38 years old now at this point. I don't think they want to be leaning on Jeff green again. Aaron Holiday played a whole lot more than I think anybody could have ever anticipated he would have played. Um, And and then I think another odd man out is Jayshon Tate. And 
I, I think that Jay Sean Tate got pushed out of the rotation last year, right up until everybody got hurt. But I, I think that if Jay Sean Tate is kind of your break in a, in case of emergency type guy, and the same thing with Jeff Green, like, I think that's what you that's what you want. I think you want guys like Tate and Green to be your break in case of emergency type guys. And both those guys know how to play. Both those guys now have been around. Both those guys have some versatility. So to me, I think those are the guys that are probably on the outside looking in when everybody's healthy. Do you think that Dylan Brooks, what do you, what do you think about the Dylan Brooks thing? Like, should he, should his role essentially be the same as it was when he was signed and what it was last year or is it a good sign for the Rockets? This is not a knock on Dylan Brooks. I want to be clear about that. I, I, my question is more so like, do you feel like it's a, a better sign for the Rockets if one of those younger guys is playing into Dylan Brooks' minutes, if that makes sense? Or is it better for the Rockets that Dylan Brooks is actually just the dude that they paid for and, and that not happens? Like, how do you view that? Because to, to me, there is going to have to be – something's got to give there, I feel like. So Brooks played 31 minutes a game last year. I think if you're the Rockets, you probably want him maybe in the high 20s, maybe the mid 20s, because that allows him to be a little bit more physical. And I think the big thing with Dylan Brooks is that fouls become an issue because of some some of it's on him, some of it's on how he's officiated. But if he can be in a role where he can go out and he can be physical and he doesn't have to worry about fouling out or picking up three fouls at the 10-minute mark of the second quarter, I think that's a good spot for him. Um, I, I don't think they want to have to rely on him nearly as much this year as they did last year, because I think the other thing with Brooks, I thought he wore down the end of last year. And I think that the level that he played defensively at the start of the year to when he got hurt in December to the way that he played defensively after he got hurt to the end of the year, there was a big difference. Like, I think that you could have made an argument for Dylan Brooks being a, a first team all NBA, first or second team all NBA type guy, the first 28 games of the season. And then I just think that he dropped off after that. So I think that, and he's not young anymore. And see, Dylan Brooks will be 29 this year. So he's not old, but like that's, I think that if you can rely on him less, then I think that that's important. And I think part of that will come with just Tari Eason being a, being healthy, being able to play, and not being on a minutes restriction for those games where he actually is healthy. All right, all right, you teed it up to 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 get us on out of here, man. It's good to be. I, let me just say that real quick, man. It's good to be back on the H Town Who's podcast. And I don't know if I mentioned Austin earlier. I hope I did, but Austin Mendez is holding things down for us behind the scenes as he always does. Glad to be here with you, Spo. But this is. The final point that I want to make, because I think it's significant, having Tari Eason back, okay, just the motor, the the shooting, the defense, the rebounding, like I, the energy that he brings off of your bench, the fact that he can start for you if you need, like if you're having, like to me, Tari Eason is the perfect player to have when guys start to get injured. So, like, it would it sucks that he would be the one that would be injured last year. But how would you describe, and I think you just did a little bit of it there, the significance of Tari Eason's return, and not taking it for granted, but just sort of the assumption that he's going to be healthy this year. What is the significance of having a healthy Tari Eason on this squad? Well, he just he changed their defense and just his ability to basically cause havoc on the floor. Obviously, it helped their defense. We talked so much about like pace and then playing faster. Well, when you're creating turnovers, you're able to play a lot faster. And I think that he was a big reason why they were able to have some success just with their transition offense last year, because he got them into transition more. And I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head anymore, but their defense was at another level when he was on the floor and losing, you know, they lost him and they lost Dylan Brooks basically at the same time. And their defense kind of fell off a cliff there in late December, early January. Uh, and obviously they never got Eason back. So I, I think that obviously he makes their defense significantly better just because of his ability to create turnovers and deflections and just kind of wreck what a, a, an opposing team's offense is trying to do. But when you're able to create turnovers, you're able to get yourself out in transition. That's easy buckets right there. So I just think that him he makes the, the defense a lot better. And in turn, that just makes your offense better.
Yeah, so Eason and and Amen Thompson are similar in this way. You you know how we talk about how they can sign all of their they can sign extensions to all of their guys that they drafted or none of them or pick which ones they want and and then of course they got to decide how what the market is how much they're going to pay them and all that those two are the only ones where and Eason is probably in a in a separate category because I think we do understand what kind of player he is that he's definitely you know a role player but between the two of those those are the two guys that I would say I'm surest about extending I just don't know what the number is because what their skill set is, is one that you want on any team on any timeline. Like, I don't care what your goals and aspirations are as a team, like what you think you are as a team, a championship contender, a playoff team, a play in contender, a rebuilding team. I don't care what you are, whatever it is, you want players like Amin Thompson and Tari Eason on the team, period. Like in in like no follow-up sentence after that. If Amen Thompson and Tari Eason are players that you absolutely want on the team. Whereas with with Jalen Green, obviously is su- supremely talented. Alperin Shingun supremely talented, but you're trying to figure out: am I building around this guy? Is this is this a uh you know a, a supporting piece, or like what what exactly is it that I'm that I'm exactly paying for? It's not that I don't want him on the team. But if, if I'm not building around him, do I want to pay him the amount of money or the kind of money that that indicates that I am or suggests that I am? You're making these kind of decisions about other guys or, or have these other factors in the decisions that you make about other guys. But with Tari Eason and Amin Thompson specifically, I look at them as just guys that straight up you want on the team or, or somebody like them on the team, no matter what kind of timeline you're on. And I co-signed everything you said about what he brings to the table in terms of the, like the the defense and then the underrated shooting ability. Like I'm not trying to paint him out to be, you know, uh, Reggie Miller or uh, you know a Curry or anything, but he can he can knock down a shot for you as well, you know. And they, I cannot reiterate enough, need as many of those guys who can do that as they possibly can. So I think it is a tremendous, tremendous help to have him. And then he's just fun to watch because of that motor, like watching him run around and wreak havoc defensively and, you know, being a part of the fast breaks, hoping that he's a better passer the next time we see him play. And it seems like he's getting better in that regard as well. Like he's just a fun player to watch and to root for, I would imagine, for for all the Rockets fans. Yeah, and haven't seen him play in a long time now. I mean, it's I, I think that he last played maybe very the very beginning of January. Hasn't played since. And, you know, again, you see little snippets here and there, but you haven't really gotten to see him play in like an organized basketball game in a while. And so I think that's one of the interesting parts of camp is like, how does he look? And are they confident that what he was dealing with last year is not something that he'll have to deal with ever again? Inside a week away from camp, go ahead. There you go. There you go. I ain't had to tell him. Well, look, look, look at me talk, talking about go ahead as if Austin Mendez don't already know what to do next. Talk about competitive basketball, actual organized. You know, the word that you use was organized basketball game. Now, let's not say competitive when it comes to preseason. Yeah, yeah, my bad. I, I, I jumped the gun there. I, I was talking with my heart what I, what I want in, instead of what we're actually going to get. But this will be organized basketball games that you'll get just in a matter of days. So October 7th, you got the Rockets against the Jazz. And October 9th, you got them against the Oklahoma City Thunder, familiar foes. Of course, it will not be the type of competition that you yearn for or that you want to get used to. But it'll it'll be a nice, I would say, appetizer, kind of get you back used to watching basketball it's been a while. I haven't I guess I haven't watched really watched competitive basketball aside from you know some of this WNBA playoffs, but like men's basketball since the Olympics, which actually feels like a very very long time ago. Wasn't a very very long time ago, but feels like a much longer time ago than it actually was. So this is gonna be exciting, man. We are back. We are back in the mix, man. So we're gonna do the do our best. I imagine Adam to balance out the Astros making yet another postseason run 
their seventh AOS title in the last eight years and seven straight if you want to just count like full length seasons. And then, of course, the Texans are, you know, the toast of the town right now as well. Here come the Rockets. Here come the Rockets to kind of just mess up all of our schedules and all of our, our sleep, Adam. So I, I figure we might as well buckle up and get ready, man. It's about to get busy around here. Yes, it is. Very much uh, so. A hundred percent. That is Adam Spillane. I am Brandon Scott. Shout out to Austin Mendez producing this bad boy, handling things for us behind the scenes. Make sure you subscribe, rate, review, tell a friend about the H-Town Who's podcast where you can get anywhere you get your podcast and also on the Sports Radio 610 YouTube page. And until next time, y'all be good.